Face here back with another reaction video and yes it's been a while and um, for those who are still wondering why please check out my um, last update video which was uploaded two or three weeks ago so that'll give you the major details so um <sighs> right yeah I'm just just getting back into the swing of things especially um, reactions so um so this time I'm reacting to History of a Mediterranean Superpower, Rise and Fall of Venice by Epic History. Now, two two of the major things that um really um well sort of mention and show any major part about Venice is um the Assassin's Creed two uh and medieval war oh god sorry words total war medieval total war 2 and uh for those who played the games you'll know what i'm talking about so uh not going to i'm not going to waste too much of your time describing what i just said um um but but the usual disclaimer when excuse me the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical, if I don't show so much what is considered a proper what is considered a proper reaction, is probably obvious I don't know much about the subject at hand and if I do know anything, I'll most likely pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions which which uh, uh, hopefully will be answered in the comments. So with that being said the link to the original video will be in the description down below. Please go and go and uh, go and uh, hopefully subscribe to Epic History, because in my opinion, they're still one of the best history channels here on YouTube. And um, and uh, there's not much more I can say. So without wasting much more of your time, that's full screened. Get that up here. The captions on. And here we go. The extraordinary city of Venice. Queen of the Adriatic. Beautiful. Behind the elegant facade of its famous domes and canals lies the dramatic history of a thousand-year empire, a maritime republic, and formidable naval power. But this great city had unlikely origins. At the height of the Roman Empire, these coastal lagoons were home only mm. to small fishing communities. But in the 5th century AD, the Western Roman Empire was overrun by barbarian tribes. As Italy became a battleground for <coughs> Huns, Goths, Eastern Romans and Lombards, many sought refuge among the lagoons. In 726, these refugees elected Orso to be their duke, or doge, the first in an unbroken line of 117 doges who'd rule Venice for a thousand years. For nearly 200 years, much of Italy was ruled by a resurgent Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. Wow. Its Italian province, known as the Exarchate of Ravenna, fell to the Lombards in 751. Only Venice held out, protected by its lagoons. In a, in a future reaction video, I might, I might, if I remember, to um, find, uh, find uh, and react to a video discussing about the kingdom, kingdom of the Lombards. But if I remember, and uh, hopefully that be a f future reaction, but time will tell. Answering the Pope's call for aid. I just want to quickly add a side note. When um, looking up the history of the Huns, no, sorry, not the Huns, but um, when Italy was invaded, if I remember right, and again, this... Uh, 
this little bit of historical uh, knowledge was, um, again, to my shame, from Age of Empires 2. For those who played that game, you'll know what I'm talking about. When uh, Italy itself was invaded by um, uh, Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire. That's another historical video which I don't think people talk about enough is Frederick Barbarossa. But anyway, I'll just get back into this. Charlemagne and the Franks came to Italy and crushed the Lombards. But they also failed to take Venice. Charlemagne's son, Pepin, King of Italy, was said to have died from a fever caught in the marshes that surrounded Venice as he tried to attack the city. In the following decades, Venice asserted its independence from the Byzantine Empire. And thanks to its location, flourished as a trading hub between Europe and the East. Venetian merchants sold Italian grain and wine to the great city of Constantinople, where they bought spices and silk to sell to Western Europe. Above all, Venice's early success came from the trade of salt, the vital food preservative of the medieval world, harvested from salt pans and lagoons. The Venetians went so far as to describe salt as il vero fondamento del nostro stato, the true foundation of our state. It's amazing how even from a simple commodity, cities or countries can get rich from simple commodities like salt. Even though at the beginning it was just for the rich, but then just became an everyday thing up to this day is still... Obviously nowadays you got more variety of salt, obviously, but even just simple salt, you can you can make such a such an illicit trade. Well, I wouldn't say illicit, but such a huge huge um I'm trying to f sorry, I'm trying to think of the right word, but like um but I am recording this a bit late. So um you can make such a huge trade just from simple commodities like salt. I'll just keep it simple there, but but the fact that, like, you know, cities like Venice can make so much money from their early success of the sale of salt, which is sold through pretty much three quarters, which nowadays is used in pretty much almost, almost three quarters of the world. But anyway, before I drift off, in eight, before I drift too much off into a into a weird rambling mess. 28, two Venetian merchants visiting Alexandria smuggled the supposed body of St. Mark back to Venice to boost the standing of their home city. The saint's relics were interred in the city's great new church, the Basilica di San Marco. Wow. The first basilica was destroyed by fire in 976. Mm. Today's cathedral, consecrated in 1094, stands on the same site. St. Mark became the city's patron saint. His emblem, the winged lion, became the symbol of the Republic and decorated its standard. Venetian trade routes to the east were plagued by pirates from the Balkan and North African coasts. So Venice built a navy to drive them from the seas and garrisoned strategic harbors and islands along the Adriatic shore. By the year 1000, doges of Venice were also styling themselves Dukes of Dalmatia. The distinctive Venetian warship was the galley, powered by up to 150 oars and triangular latine sails rigged fore and aft. Weapons included a battering ram and around 30 crossbowmen. Galleys were also used to transport high-value cargo, such as spices, silks, or precious stones. In 1103, construction began of Venice's famous Arsenale, a giant state-owned shipyard that would become one of Europe's largest industrial centers, employing around 2,000 workmen and turning out hundreds of ships a year. 
the Arsenale pioneered many modern industrial techniques and underpinned Venetian naval power for centuries. Armed with a powerful navy and lucrative trading concessions from the Byzantine Emperor, Venice rose to become the greatest commercial and naval power in the Eastern Mediterranean. But Venetian power also came through shrewd negotiation and self-interest. This was the age of the Crusades, and Venice was closely in... Yeah, that's... that was... I think I've said it before in other videos back along where this was the major down... this was the start of the major downfall of uh, the Eastern or Byz Eastern Roman or Byzant Byz Byzantine Empire was their was their loss at the Battle of Manzikert against the Seljuk Turks. Involved with Crusader states as allies and trading partners. In 1202, the Fourth Crusade arrived in Venice, seeking wow. ships to take them to Egypt, but with no money to pay for them. Doge Enrico Dandolo sensed an opportunity. In exchange for loans, he first persuaded the Crusaders to capture Zadar for Venice. Then, relations having soured between Venice and the Byzantines, to attack Constantinople itself. In 1204, the world's greatest Christian city was sacked and plundered by self-proclaimed warriors of Christ. Venice took its share of the loot, including most famously four bronze horses from the Hippodrome of Constantine, which found a new home on the facade of St. Mark's Basilica in the centre of Venice. Just quickly read, read this. The original sculptures were removed in 1973 due to conservation concerns and replaced by these replicas. The originals are on display inside of St. Mark's Basilica. Okay. Doge Enrico and the Crusaders carved up the Byzantine Empire between mm. them. Venice got the islands of the Aegean, Crete and the strategically placed ports of Modone and Coroni, known henceforth as the Eyes of the Republic. Empire brought Venice unprecedented wealth and power, but fueled a bitter rivalry with another Italian maritime republic, Genoa. For more than a century, these two Italian city-states vied for supremacy in the eastern Mediterranean, their wars ranging from the Levant to Sicily, the Aegean, Black Sea and Adriatic. During these wars, a Venetian captain named Marco Polo was taken prisoner oh. and used his time in a Genoese jail to dictate an account of his travels in China. The rivalry became a regional conflict, Genoa making alliances with the Habsburg Duke of Austria, the King of Hungary and Padua. Venice with the revived Byzantine Empire, Cyprus and Milan. The fortunes of war ebbed and flowed until in 1379, Venice came under attack from land and sea with a Genoese force occupying Chioggia, just 15 miles south of the city. But Venice miraculously turned the tables, using galleys armed with gunpowder artillery for the first time to trap and capture the Genoese fleet. The wars finally ended in 1381 with the Peace of Turin. Venice had to make significant concessions and, like Genoa, had been exhausted by war. But while Genoa soon fell victim to internal feuding, Venice would stage an... I wonder, if I go back a frame, is because um, this, for those who know their geography and their history, this is the island of Corsica. And it has been mentioned before, before uh, this, this was the birthplace of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, or his original Italian name, if I remember this rightly, and I can pronounce it properly, hopefully, is was uh, Napoleone Buonaparte. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, this was owned by Genua. Genua, sorry. Don't know why I struggle with that one. Um, and then afterwards, it became independent for a short while before being ruled by France up until the up until this day. And it's still owned by France. For those who didn't understand how I said that, but still, the birthplace of Napoleon Bonaparte used to be under under the rule of, of Genoa so I wonder if that's part of the internal feuding or probably that's one of the major concessions they had to give up but anyway sorry I'm Genoa soon fell there. victim to internal feuding sorry that I was drifting off into a different subject so Venice would stage an astonishing recovery thanks in large part to the unique system of government by which the Republic was now ruled. The most miraculous city of Venice. Rich in gold, but richer in fame. Strong in power, but stronger in virtue. Built on both solid marble and the harmony of its citizens. Petrarch. While Western Europe was dominated by kings who claimed to rule by divine right, Several Italian city-states harked back to classical forms of government, chiefly the idea of the Republic, res publica, the thing of the people. However, at the height of its power, Venice's Republic, La Serenissima as it was known, was firmly in the hands of its nobility. Only those whose names were listed in the Golden Book, the city's registry of nobility, could join the Great Council, which appointed all senior officials through a complex system of voting and drawing lots. They chose 40 of their members to form the Quarantia, who supervised economic affairs, and two to 300 to form the Senate, the main legislative body, attended in addition by the Republic's admirals, generals, and diplomats. The elected head of government remained the Doge. His powers had been steadily diminished until by the 1400s, so, I would guess similar to a constitutional monarchy. He was no more, but more similar, Venetians joked, than a tavern sign, mm. a decorative symbol of power, though he continued to wield huge influence. The Republic's day-to-day -day government was the Signoria, made up of the Doge, mm -hmm. the six members of his minor council, and three representatives wow. of the Quarantia. They could be joined by three boards of special advisors, mm. known as the Savi, or wise men, to form the full college. The Council of Ten, meanwhile, had a special remit to sniff out subversion. Mm. It was a system that eventually acquired so many checks and balances that change, for good or ill, seemed both unimaginable and undesirable. The Constitution of Venice an insuperable monument of wisdom and efficiency. Gasparo Contarini. Over time, an idea developed across Europe that Venice's constitution contained the three classical forms of government. Democracy, oligarchy, and monarchy, in perfect balance, and so ensured social harmony and stability. The Unlike politics of modern day, the myth of Venice, as this became known, overlooked the Republic's healthy tradition. Sorry, I am I am not a fan of any politician. No matter what their standing is, i just not very trusting of any politician whatsoever. ...of attempted coups, rampant corruption and social tension. But the Venetians did achieve something rare in the medieval and Renaissance world a durable, stable, and effective government. The Serene Republic had one further strikingly modern feature. The best diplomats in Europe, skilled ambassadors in every capital and court, sending information back to Venice in secret code from across the continent. Venice would need every advantage for the years ahead would be dominated by bitter wars with her Italian neighbours and new challenges to her empire. 
You Venetians are very wrong to disturb the peace of other states, rather than to rest content with the most splendid state of Italy, which you already possess. If you knew how you are universally hated, your hair would stand on end. You are alone with all the world against you. Wow. Galeazzo Sforza. For centuries, Venice had stood apart from the territorial wars of her Italian neighbours, focusing instead on her maritime empire. But the war with Genoa, and particularly the Genoese occupation of Chioggia, had shown the Venetians that their city was vulnerable. In 1404, she was attacked again by former allies, the Carrara family of yeah, that seems to be a typical political thing with empires, is um, a moment of weakness, you'll never know which of your allies may turn on you when you're in your moment of weakness. Padua. But the Republic assembled a large army from across her empire and was victorious, annexing Padua and wow. conquering Verona. More gains followed in Friuli. Doge Francesco Foscari, whose 34-year reign was the longest of any doge, was determined that Venice must continue to expand her territory in Italy for her own security. He used the Republic's enormous wealth to hire bands of mercenaries, led by captains known in Italy as condottieri. Their name came from the Italian word condotta, or contract, and they had been an important feature of Italian warfare since the 1300s. Initially, these mercenary bands were led by, and made up of, foreigners. Catalans, Germans, Hungarians, even Englishmen. Wow. But by the 1400s, Italian condottieri were leading these armies, waging wars on behalf of competing states and sometimes even conquering Italian states for themselves. Condottieri would often switch their allegiance to the highest bidder. Yep. Their soldiers were equally disloyal and notoriously unruly. Since they fought for nothing but personal gain and often switched sides, they had no interest in slaughter. And so their battles were often theatrical and virtually bloodless affairs. The ambitions of the Venetian doge and his condottieri put Venice on a collision course with the leading power in northern Italy, the Duchy of Milan. A long war began between the two states and their allies, with the Venetians winning a great victory at Maclodio. In the treaty that followed, Venice gained yet more territory, pushing west past Bergamo to the River Adda. But war soon broke out again. For nearly three decades, northern Italy was ravaged by bands of mercenaries. Their leaders were immortalized by the great artists of the day. Men such as Francesco Sforza and Bartolomeo Colleoni. Finally, by the Peace of Lodi, Venice secured her Domini di Terraferma, her mainland state, to go with her Stato da Mar, her overseas empire. Forty years of relative peace followed. Shattered in 1494, when the King of France, Charles VIII, invaded Italy with a large army. His goal? to enforce his hereditary claim to the Kingdom of Naples. But his actions united even bitter enemies like Milan and Venice against him. I don't know if there is because of uh, what pirates could have been still lurking in the... or enemy naval powers are still prominent in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, but like... Surely if you could could manage it you'll try and take your huge army straight to Naples unless there's some major naval power stopping them but you'll get what I mean feel free to answer that in the comments the Italian states formed the League of Venice 
led by the Borgia Pope Alexander VI, and fought. Or for those who know, if you know, you know, his real name is Rodrigo Borgia. King Charles of and is an actual Spaniard. For Novo, but could not prevent his escape back to France. It was the beginning of a long conflict, known simply as the Italian Wars, which saw northern Italy become the primary battleground in the bitter contest between the kings of France and the Habsburg emperors. It was fought against the backdrop of the Italian Renaissance and Protestant Reformation, a complex and sprawling conflict that would last six decades. The early display of Italian unity was short-lived. Mm. Venice soon switched sides, allying with the King of France against Milan in order to share in the spoils of her defeat. Venetian ambition was now regarded as a major threat by her Italian neighbors. Yeah. Of these, none was more ruthless than the Pope. Of course. Pope Julius II, mm. the man who commissioned Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel and created the Pope's famous Swiss Guard, was determined to crush Venetian power. Venice, he declared, would be returned to the status of a fishing village. Pope Julius issued a papal decree excommunicating the entire Venetian Republic, a bold move that effectively declared open season on the Venetian state, its assets and citizens. And they say uh, the Catholic Church is not corrupt. Yeah. But anyway, to my original point, I was going to say is um, for those who are not sure how to um, perceive that, it's basically any Catholic nation who will answer the call to attack Venice or anyone that's been excommunicated by the Pope. Any Catholic nation. He also assembled a formidable alliance against Venice, the League of Cambrai, the mightiest ever faced by a single Italian state. Venice faced an existential threat. In 1509, at the Battle of Agnadello, her forces suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the French king. One contemporary, the Florentine diplomat Niccolò Machiavelli, wrote that Venice had lost in one day what it had taken her 800 years to conquer. However, the Italian wars were notorious, not just for their many atrocities, but their shifting alliances, yeah. twists and turns. Within a year, the Pope had switched sides, forming an alliance with Venice to fight the French. Then Venice switched sides, siding with France against the Pope, and helping to win a crushing victory over the Pope's Swiss mercenaries at Marignano. Just eight years after Venice faced destruction by the League of Cambrai, the Treaty of Noyon restored nearly all her former territories. The Republic had run the gauntlet of foreign powers and formidable alliances. But through sharp diplomacy, political flexibility, and a little good fortune, she had survived. It is the most triumphant city that I have ever seen. Philippe de Comines. Despite the long years of war, the Venetian Republic was a driving force of the Italian Renaissance, and the 15th and 16th centuries were its golden age. Venice was home to great Renaissance painters, such as Giovanni and Gentile Bellini, Vittorio Carpaccio, Titian, and Tintoretto. Oh, brilliant. Architects like Palladio, a 
and scholars like Francesco Barbaro. He was one of the new humanists who devoted their lives to the rediscovery, study and sharing of texts from ancient Greece and Rome. Venice became a beacon for the greatest European minds of the age. Visitors included the great Dutch philosopher Erasmus of Rotterdam and the Italian astronomer Galileo, who demonstrated his telescope for the Doge. But Venetians had a reputation as doers rather than thinkers. Their city was renowned as a centre of craftsmanship, producing Europe's finest glassware, as well as silks, cottons and wood carvings. Nowhere were the city's mercantile and scholarly traditions more brilliantly combined than in the world of printing. Doge Cristoforo Moro issued the city's first printing license in 1469. Thirty years later, Venice was producing more books than Florence, Milan, Rome and Naples combined. What a massive margin. Venice was where Aldus Manutius invented the paperback and set out mm -hmm. to publish every surviving great work from classical Greece. By the end of the 15th century, Venice was the printing capital of the world. Such industry, against a backdrop of a city often described as the most beautiful in the world. The Venetians combined Renaissance architectural ideals with their city's unique lagoon setting and created a masterpiece. The famous Grand Canal, the Rialto Bridge, and the Bridge of Sighs, where prisoners got their last glimpse of the beauty of Venice before descending into its cells. And all along the Grand Canal, the palaces of the city's great merchant families. Because for all its grandeur, business here was never less than cutthroat. Venetian merchants were the most treacherous, lying, thieving scoundrels such as I never believed existed on earth. Well, that puts them in competition. That description is better suited to politicians than merchants. But yeah, I can imagine. Because I think some people say in business, there's no such thing as friends, only partners and competition when it comes to business. According to one visitor, the German printmaker Albrecht Dürer. Do not awake our terrible sword, for we shall wage most cruel war against you everywhere. Neither put your trust in your treasure, for we shall cause it suddenly to run from you like a torrent. Beware, therefore, lest you arouse our wrath. Ottoman Sultan Selim II to the Signoria of Venice. While Venetian culture flourished, across the seas her empire faced a new and terrible threat. In 1453, the Byzantine Empire, which Venice had helped to weaken two centuries before, fell to the Ottoman Turks. Initially, the relationship between Venice and the Ottomans was businesslike. Yep. Venetian merchants were allowed to remain in Constantinople with the same trading privileges they'd always had under the Byzantine Empire. But there could be no illusions about the Turks' next target. Ottoman Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror had the Venetian Empire firmly in his sights. The onslaught was not long in coming. Argos and Negroponte fell first, as Venice struggled to defend her empire against Ottoman military might. This conflict would last, on and off, for more than two centuries. The Venetian fleet, once so dominant, was overwhelmed by Ottoman naval forces, led by skilled admirals such as Heredin Barbarossa. By 1500, even the twin eyes of the Republic, Modone and Coroni, 
had been put out. Successive doges could only watch on, powerless, as the Venetian power base in the east crumbled. In 1570, the Ottomans came for Cyprus. The garrison of Famagusta only surrendered after an 11-month siege. In violation of the terms of surrender, the Venetian commander, Marcantonio Bragadin, was flayed alive. For those who don't know who that is, basically using a knife, cutting and then peeling your skin while you're wide awake. Sorry, that's After a century of Venetian defeats, efforts to form a Christian alliance against the Ottomans finally paid off, and the Holy League, led by Venice and Spain, sent a powerful fleet east. They met the Ottomans in the greatest galley battle in history, at Lepanto. The Venetians, fired on by their desire to avenge Bragadin's terrible death, led the Christian fleet to a stunning victory. But for all its fame, Lepanto did little to shift the balance of power in the Mediterranean. The Ottoman onslaught had been merely blunted not defeated. The dominion of Crete is Italy's outer defence, the gate whereby the insidious force of the Turk may penetrate to the great hurt of the major part of Europe. Venetian ambassador Giovanni Sagredo to Oliver Cromwell. Oh, wow. A period of peace followed, but Venice was now a fading power. The Republic's prestige had always been linked to her dominance of the seas, but this was in steep decline. Crucially, she'd fallen behind in shipbuilding technology. While Venice clung on to her old galleys, Portuguese and Spanish captains sailed their caravels and carracks out into the Atlantic, pioneering new sea routes west to America and east to India and East Asia. For centuries, the wealth of Venice had relied on Eastern trade via the Byzantine and then Ottoman empires. Now, she had been cut out. And while Venice fought costly wars in Italy and the Mediterranean, the city was repeatedly ravaged by plague. The Black Death of 1348 was the first, but outbreaks in 1575 and 1629 were almost as lethal, each killing about a third of the city's population. The government did what it could to prevent the spread of infection. Residents were ordered to stay home, though an exception was... When it comes to nowadays, one question. Sound familiar? But again, it's probably a bit of a harsh, harsh judgment because um, it's probably one of the few ways that you can know not to spread such a thing, such a, such a disease. Was made for the funeral of the city's most famous artist, Titian. New arrivals had to isolate themselves aboard ship for 40 days. The quarantena, that's the origin of quarantine. With Venice weakened by war and plague, the Ottomans sensed an easy victory. In 1645, they attacked Venice's last major overseas possession, Crete. The Republic rallied. Funds were raised from the nobility, and appeals went out to the crowned heads of Europe to fight once more for Christendom. But this time, Venice would stand alone. Most of Crete was quickly overrun, but under the leadership of Francesco Morosini, said to always enter battle with his cat by his side, the port of Candia mounted a heroic resistance that was to last 21 years one of the longest sieges in history. 
Simultaneously, an epic struggle raged across the Aegean Sea. Venetians and Ottomans now almost equal in naval power. Ultimately, the Venetians on their own could not save Crete. In 1669, with many thousands dead and the city in ruins, Candia surrendered to the Ottomans. After 465 years of Venetian rule, Crete had finally fallen. Fifteen years later, Venice and Doge Morosini had their chance for revenge. In 1683, the Ottomans were defeated at the gates of Vienna, and Venice joined the grand counter-offensive known as the Great Turkish War. When he talks about the Battle of Vienna and the Ottoman Turks, another question. Any Sabaton uh, fans watching, you know what what will be. You know what song they'll. You know what song I'm talking about. Morosini led an expedition that recaptured Lefkada and the Greek Peloponnese. Well, I'll just say it. Um, Basically, until Vienna had the ultimate backup of uh, the Polish winged hussars. Then known as the Morea. But during the Venetian siege of Athens, one of their shells hit the Parthenon, where the Ottomans were storing ammunition. The resulting explosion tore through the 2,000 year old temple, smashing columns and collapsing the roof. Venice's restored empire in Greece did not last long. By 1714, the Ottomans had recovered sufficiently to launch a swift campaign that reconquered the Morea. This, the seventh war between Venice and the Ottoman Empire, would prove the last. The reason was simple. Venice was no longer a Mediterranean power. She is reduced to a passive existence. She has no more wars to sustain, pieces to conclude, or desires to express. A mere spectator of events, in her determination to take no part in events, she pretends to take no interest in them. Count Paul Daru. The 18th century saw Venice continue to shine as a cultural beacon a city that dazzled visitors with its canals, churches, opera and art. Bereft of empire, Venice crystallized into a state of glorious, luxurious stagnation, rigidly conservative, incapable of reform. Industry, commerce and military power were neglected. So when the French Revolutionary Wars turned northern Italy into a battleground once more, Venice was ripe for picking. In 1796, a young French general named Napoleon Bonaparte, backed by a powerful army, demanded the Republic's surrender. There was nothing the Doge and Great Council could do but accept his terms. The French, assisted by Italian revolutionaries, tore down symbols of the Ancien Régime and La Serenissima's proud history as an independent republic. The horses of Saint Marc were among hundreds of artworks crated up and sent to Paris. At the Feast of Liberty, the insignia and robes of the last doge and the famous Golden Book were brought to the Piazza San Marco and burned. A thousand years of Venetian independence was at an end. Venice was awarded to Austria in 1797, later incorporated into Napoleon's Kingdom of Italy, and then after his defeat returned to Austria as part of the Kingdom of Lombardy Venetia. But Venetian patriotism had not been completely snuffed out. In 1848, inspired by revolutions across Europe, 
its citizens rose up against the Austrians, declaring the formation of the Republic of San Marco. Austria gradually regained control of its Italian territories. But Venice, aided by its old ally, the sea, held out longest. The Austrians even tried floating balloons carrying bombs into the city, the world's first aerial bombardment, though results were disappointing. After a 17-month siege, Venice surrendered and returned to Austrian control. But the 1848 revolutions had stoked the flames of Italian nationalism and desire for unification. The dreams of the Risorgimento were realized in the 1860s, and Venice became part of a new national state, the Kingdom of Italy. Though its empire is long gone, the splendor of Venice endures. It has remained a magnet for artists and poets, its light and lagoon fascinating painters like Turner and Monet. Its romantic waterways seducing writers from Lord Byron to Ernest Hemingway. Now, La Serenissima faces the challenges of mass tourism and rising seas. Venetians are fighting back where they can, successfully pressuring authorities to reroute the largest cruise ships and limit the size of tourist groups. But Venice now finds itself on the front line of the global climate crisis. There are fears that it could be engulfed by the sea before the end of the century. This extraordinary city, the center of a powerful maritime empire that lasted more than a thousand years, has more battles to come. If you can't wait for your next fix of epic history, then head over to Nebula, where you can watch our brand new Battle of the Nile video right now. Catalog ad free and see new That's just $30 a year. Even better, the Nebula lifetime. To all our existing Nebula subscribers and for everyone to make this channel possible. All right, feel, feel free feel free to check them out if you're interested so um yeah that'll do it this has been uh, such an interesting video and uh and uh yeah it's a topic that i don't see talked about more often but that's all i can say so um so if you like this reaction please like comment and subscribe and i will see you in the next one